by the time the third crisis occurred in April 2001, uh, they still had less than not recovered that much. And if anything, if the, if the Chinese didn't like Clinton, they weren't really happy with Bush either. You remember, he was criticizing, the government was just criticizing the Clinton administration for its pleasure being too soft. It's like recurring frame in the U.S. China administration during the president's campaign, criticizing Congress being too soft. Um, after assuming office, they made the Bush administration make comments about their concern. They saw China's potential uh, peer competitor or at least a regional competitor. So they were developing assumptions about some kind of framework in which they bolster U.S. alliances, move closer to Taiwan, raise Taiwan's strength. Um, and as part of this effort, the Chinese were criticizing that, but they were also very upset about this practice the United States was having this flying, this reconnaissance planes, very close. Uh, increasing the number of planes very close to the, to the Chinese mainland. They were protesting against this very vigorously, and the U.S. sort of down planes protest saying, well, we're in international airspace, we have the right to do this. And then April 1st, uh, there was a collision. There are two Chinese inter fly uh, fighters went up to intercept the DD3 surveillance plane that was monitoring, and one of the, the Chinese fighters crashed into it. Uh, he was killed. The plane had been crash landing in China. Uh, and then Angolan Island, which was a, a control by the military. Um, Washington, they again scrambled, how, didn't know how to react to this crisis. You can have this problem about that occurring somewhat early in the administration before the integration process had been developed, before there had been some of the senior people had been confirmed. Um, because of the timing of the collision occurred at night, the first response came from the Pacific Command. And they were naturally very concerned about the plane. They made a statement saying you know, the Chinese had to leave the plane alone. The only thing they could do was quickly prepare to allow it to fly out. Um, Chinese were furious. They said, well, look, you know, this is a spy plane. It's a commercial plane. Uh, our pilot was killed, not, you know, not yours. You know, you need to be a bit more apologetic. And they had, again, you didn't see the wave of Nazi uh, mass protests you saw in 89. So I think the Chinese were a little concerned that the, it's an 89, that, that the protests might get out of hand. So they were trying to refrain it again. But they kept hold of the crew in the plane for a little while. They didn't let the U.S. have the contact with it. And the president's first reaction was, well, this is, again, an obvious accident, so the Chinese will let it go. So he didn't really get involved that much initially. Um, after a few days, they became concerned that the Chinese were just going to hang on to the crew as a hostage or some, uh, relationship. And so they started making statements saying, well, we're very, you know, we were making a lot of sincere condolences for what happened. But if you keep on hanging on to our in plane, this accident quote has a potential of undermining our hopes for a fruitful and productive relationship between our two countries. We then had a set of initial negotiations to resolve the crisis, and you had arguments over what kind of apology you give. And the Americans were concerned about the legal implications of a formal apology, where the Chinese seemed to say they were concerned, they wanted expressions of condolences. Uh, to be sincere, not just pro forma. And you ended up with what's known as the letter of the two sorries. Uh, the, the, the United States said they were very sorry about the loss of file, and they were very sorry that a plane had to land in Chinese territory without your permission. Uh, after your order fighter crashed into it, they didn't put in to say that. Um, and uh, they, again, negotiated the settlement. In terms of the questions, there's many more details in the book, but I'm way out of time here. So I just want to get to the, the main conclusions. The more, the more interesting part is how this relates to the questions asked with PNSR. In terms of integrated strategy formation, uh, each of the administrations came into office with an integrated strategy. I mean, they, they all share the general consensus. You want to see less repressive of China. You want to see less bellicose uh, foreign policy. You want to see open up liberalized domestic democratically. But they differed in how this worked. As I mentioned, the first President Bush was very much a geopolitic, felt that you couldn't really force the issue, it would be counterproductive. Uh, Clinton administration, some, you had, basically they didn't resolve how to do this. Under the rubric of construction engagement, you had people arguing basically what should be the priority, human rights, non-proliferation, defense supremacy, and they really didn't resolve this, this conflict. Uh, the Bush administration, the second one, the this occurred too early for it to have a full-fledged strategy. But it certainly had a framework. It was beginning to see the, the time as a strategic competitor that had to be managed. And it, I suspect the plane, the, the collision might have accelerated that trend if it hadn't been for the September 11th events, which we all know just reoriented the focus of the administration and the rest of the United States. And China became something of a de facto ally, something, something not of what was going the war on terrorism. In terms of interagency collaboration, in terms of policy implementation, the second question of interest, um, the presidents found they, they really had uh, 
with existing machinery and presses didn't help them manage a lot of these crises. So you had them resort to various ad hoc strategies. And as we've seen in the other cases in the book, these can work in some limited cases, but they're difficult to carry on, and they don't have the institutional support that allows them to work well over the long term. So the sending off Stokroft um, and, uh, to, 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 and Eagleberger to, to reasoning helped get, basically it helped stop the escalation of the crisis. But when Congress found out about it, they were furious. When the bureaucracy found out about it, they felt they'd been excluded from the process. And so it just, it didn't, it made it difficult to sustain that kind of relationship. They, the Clinton administration, uh, we found, uh, I mentioned that it was having lots of problems orchestrating both the general way in which the agencies work together. And then there is the crisis. Uh, there was a lot of tension between the military and intelligence community and the civilians over how much you wanted to tell the Chinese. I mean, the military and the intelligence were, I think, reasons John to tell so well. I mean, they didn't feel like telling the Chinese why they, how they selected their targets in much detail and why and what criteria they used or showing them you know, the, 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 the sources and methods they were using. Um, and that may put the civilians in an awkward situation. They kept on trying to reassure the, the, the uh, Chinese, no, it's just been an accident, but without really understanding why itself, why it didn't happen to them. Um, the second Bush administration, uh, you saw this divergence between the military and civilians over how to respond to the crisis. And it's unclear why. I mean, it's possible, uh, a common explanation, I'm not sure if this is true in this case, but you sort of have a traditional caucus, the U.S. defense community, and a Dutch diplomatic community, which, which is why the, the initial response by the Pentagon might have rubbed the Chinese the wrong way. Um, but it's also possible it's just a simple question of time differences. I mean, why people woke up before they did in Washington, so they responded first. Um, or maybe even have been a deliberate tactic, you know, good club, bad club, to try and force the Chinese to make concessions. Uh, and, but you really didn't see much progress until the president moved in and silenced the Pentagon and had the State Department take the lead. And he and Powell made some statements to the Chinese felt comfortable calling. 